Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. My name is Sally Potter. I'm a social scientist from New Zealand in GNS Science, which is our um, geological observatory, essentially. Um, but part of my role is working with the World Meteorological Organization World Weather Research Program um, High Impact Weather Project, along with my co-chair of this session, Brian Golding from the Met Office here. I'm going to give a little wave, Brian. So welcome everyone who is in person and online. In this session today, we are going to be talking a little bit about what the high weather or high impact weather project is, um, discussing about the value chain project with the speaker, David Hoffman, uh, looking at the research gaps and challenges for impact-based forecasts and warnings. And then we're having a more interactive workshop activity, including with those people online, and then wrap up by three. So with that, I'm actually going to hand over to our first speaker, which is Brian. Thank you very much, Sally. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. good. Okay. Uh, is it this one? Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about the uh, high, high, high impact weather, high weather project itself, um, uh, set up uh, to essentially to save lives and property through better warnings. Uh, bringing together the physical sciences of hazard forecasting with the social sciences of hazard impact and warning communication. Uh, it's one of three projects that was started by the World Weather Research Programme in about 2014-15, uh, following on from the very successful ThorpeX project, which did a lot of good work on uh, advancing our understanding of uh, mid-latitude weather systems in particular and how to forecast them. Uh, and laid the, gra the grounds, the foundations for looking further down the, uh, the uh, warning chain to the social science aspects. Um, so we started formally in January 2015. And for the first few years, our focus was on reviewing our knowledge and promoting research in five disciplinary areas, which I'll show you in a minute. Those disciplinary areas equally split between the physical and social sciences. Then uh, after our sort of our, our midpoint, we shifted focus to a set of cross-disciplinary, what we call flagship projects, which you're gonna hear more about uh, as we go forward. So this is what the uh, project looks like in summary. Uh, so we have five pillars, um, which are like, pretty much disciplinary uh, on uh, understanding the processes that enable us, uh, that underpin predictability on actually forecasting hazards, uh, whether in the weather, sorry, the, the weather itself or in the uh, associated environmental areas such as the oceans or the hydro, hydrological uh, uh, cycle. Uh, then vulnerability and risk leading us to uh, predict the impact of the hazard. Uh, communication about formulating and, and uh, then transferring warnings so that uh, people take action. And then the evaluation of the warnings and uh, uh, forecasts and warnings themselves. So right the way across the whole, the whole lot. We uh, chose a set of uh, hazards which you can see around the outside there, which cover most of the more common ones. Uh, perhaps the key one that is missing um, is um, that, that's become more important in recent years is the flash flood uh, uh, landslide concept, although uh, it uh, occurs in urban flood, of course. And then uh, all of that leading towards early warnings and early action amongst social, economic, and environmental stakeholders. So uh, we asked the question sort of midway through, uh, what makes a warning successful? And fundamentally, uh, it's that losses of life, property, business, and services are avoided by decisions that are taken in response to the warning. So it's essentially an action-related uh, definition. A mitigating action must exist and must have been taken. A warning must have been received and understood that fed into that uh, myth, uh, the, the taking of that action. And the information in that warning must be sufficiently complete and accurate to enable that uh, 
action to be taken reliably. And uh, li linking those together is the production chain, uh, value chain for the, uh, for the warning process. And David Hoffman will say a bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. And this is our concept of the warning value chain, except Google Drive has screwed up some of the um, graphics, but never mind. Uh, the essence of there is that we have a number, quite a number of areas of expertise, often in different organizations, sometimes in different departments of the same organization. Bodies of expertise that people have built up experience, they've built up methods and technologies that enable them to bring to bear on the problem of, of uh, identifying and uh, uh, measuring like um, high impact weather hazards and their impacts. But in doing so, each of these areas has produced its own language, its own culture, its own view of what's important. And when they need to talk to each other, there's often miscommunication or even lack of communication um, and every time that happens, we lose that uh, all that expertise that's been built up uh, very expensively over time. So what we need to do is to bridge those gaps. And the, uh, the extent to which we can build those bridges, the height of the bridges, if you like, uh, determines how effective the warning chain is as a whole. And obviously, the, the metaphor there is, is for the building of partnerships between these groups. So starting at the communication end, um, some of the issues to do with communication, uh, that we're using the right channels, the right media to actually get to people, that we're using the language um, that they understand and that's culturally relevant to them, that they're prepared, they know what to do when they get the warning, they believe the warning and trust the warning in order to take action, and that it has the content that they need in order to understand. So the hazard, the impact, the action they need to take, where there's going to be affected and when, and who the warning has come from. And I reference there the uh, Communicating High Impact Weather uh, paper there in IG, uh, the International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction in 2018. Uh, that was a special issue that was produced by the uh, as part of our review of communication. And some of the inhibitors, uh, just um, to whiz through them. So did you receive the warning or didn't you? Uh, were you somewhere where you couldn't receive it? Or were you somewhere uh, where you didn't, uh, the, the particular channels used didn't reach you? For instance, if you were at the gym or if you were out uh, jogging. Then did you understand it? Was it in my first language? Did it relate to my location as I understand my location? Was it consistent with my traditional knowledge? Did I believe it? Uh, where did it come from? Did it come from the government? In some countries, yes, it came from the government, I believe it. In another country, yes, it came from the government, I therefore don't believe it. Um, you need to know the difference. Did it come from the village elder or the priest? Uh, is that the way that com uh, information is communicated in my country? Was there an action available for me to take? This is often the one that gets lost. Um, people don't recognize, uh, uh, haven't prepared for this particular hazard, or they can't think what it was at this point in time. Um, and then uh, did they actually take action? Were they physically able? Moving on then to the other end of the chain, uh, what do we understand about the atmosphere? So uh, physical science has been hugely successful in predicting the weather most of the time, uh, but it is limited by the resolution of our forecast models. And that means that there are some things that are associated with some of the more important hazards that we can't yet predict at least in a deterministic sense. We may be able to predict them statistically over an area. There's also a limit from the chaotic nature of the atmosphere. So for a thunderstorm, for instance, uh, we cannot expect to be able to predict specifics more than an hour ahead. Um, so far as high weather is concerned, a uh, lot of the work in this area has been done within a German program called Waves to Weather, um, which has addressed this particular 
challenge and focus particularly on the sources of error, error growth in forecasts of high impact weather. And I give a reference there, if you're interested, to a 2021 publication in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, which uh, gives an overview of the work they've been doing. Having understood it, we can then put that into the practice of actually predicting hazards. Um, again, physical science has been pretty successful in doing this. Cont current research continues to push the boundaries of resolution and complexity, and particularly is moving from just forecasting the weather to current coupling the weather with the land surface hydrology, with the uh, ocean, and with atmospheric chemistry, uh, enabling it to predict more of the relevant hazards. Uh, really short-term forecasts with uh, high degrees of precision and accuracy can be made using now casting models, which have been developed in the last 20 years or so, and new observing methods of the atmosphere are uh, enabling us to improve those forecasts. Uh, so again, a reference there to a paper in the uh, Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, uh, published in 2021 on uh, the current status in this area. Uh, so the next step is, is converting what the hazard will be into what it will do. And this is really important for people to understand what their risk is. Um, and the impacts may be on people, property, business, or central services. Um, and that means research needs to be brought together from uh, areas like epidemiology, economics, um, very widespread and absolutely not something you can get an individual to do all of. And there is always this temptation in um, uh, management organizations, in weather services to try and do everything. It absolutely cannot work in this area. You have to do it through partnership. Um, and later in the session, so that Sally's going to talk about the uh, how we are trying to identify the key gaps in our knowledge of impact-based warnings. Um, a, in terms of obtaining complete and accurate information, one of the key issues is that hazards tend to be on a very small scale. The professional observing networks are on far too coarse a scale to capture everything. And so one of the we, we have one of our flagship projects is looking at the contribution of citizen science and um, has produced a guidance note on how to run citizen science projects, is currently in the process of producing a second guidance notice uh, note, note on uh, crowdsourcing of information specifically. Um, I reference there at the bottom, the guidance note on citizen science projects. Um, and uh, they've been doing some really good work with the Young Earth System Science community, um, co-hosting webinars um, to promote this sort of work. So High Weather uh, it was a 10 year project. It ends next year. Uh, it, in, it has brought together a, a load of people who are passionate about reducing weather related disaster losses. And it's generated a momentum towards better combined use of social and physical science evidence. Um, one of the outcomes of, of that process has been our book, Towards the Perfect Weather Warning, which is a key resource for designing and building warning services. If you're interested, there is a copy on the REAP uh, uh, booth out in the entrance area. And our work will not finish at the end of next year. Uh, it will be fed into the next generation of World Weather Research Programme research projects, which kick off uh, also during next year. So there will be a small overlap. And I think that's me finished. Uh, there is a QR code for the book, which is free to download. Do feel free to do so. Thank you. Brian? Uh, next, we've got David Hoffman to talk about the value chain project, which is one of the projects within the high weather project. Thank you, Sally. Um, so yeah, my name is David Hoffman, it's Bureau of Metrology in Melbourne, and I'm going to talk to you about this value chain project. So obviously, judging by its name, the value chain that Brian has explained before, it's at its centerpiece. And this project tries to understand the whole warning production process 
during an actual severe weather event, looking at what went wrong and how improvements can be made and measured along the way. Um, so just as a quick overview, it's, this is a four-year project and it kicked off in November 2020, so we're already three quarters of the way through it. Not as I thought before, it's only halfway, a lot quicker than we thought. Um, this is led by a researcher at the Bureau of Meteorology with support from myself and another colleague. And it's worth mentioning that this is a joint effort with this socioeconomic research application working group. Kind of they put together the proposals and um, proposed this project. You can find more information also on this project on the High Weather webpage and like a dedicated email address with the Bureau of Meteorology. We have a wide uh, range of expertise in this international project, and we're very grateful for all these contributions that are voluntarily from all the national weather services across the world, from different research institutions, from universities, and even the, pipe, the, the private sector. So the project has two main objectives. Um, starting at the top, um, one is, is to understand uh, the concept of the value chain and how to apply it to a uh, weather and climate context because the original concept originates from the economic studies for manufacturing, where you can measure the value um, in the processes where something is made valuable of something used before. So this can be applied to the production of the warning as well. And we are looking at different ways to measure um, the increasing or decreasing value of a warning as it traverses through the warning chain. For this, we are putting together a framework um, on value chain guidance for practitioners we're currently drafting and hope to finish it, or at least a draft by the end of this year. The second part then is to review existing warnings change for actual high impact weather events by looking at events that have happened in the past uh, couple of years and to collect a lot of data and to understand really um, what went wrong and what went well actually to us also learn from best practice. Um, for this, we have to develop the questionnaire that covers all the different mountains that you've seen before and the bridges as well. So looking particularly at the information flow between the mountains. And for this, we're collecting a lot of detailed information about those events um, to tease out the, the learnings and the gaps that emerged. Uh, once we've collected a couple of those case studies, we're looking into putting those into a living catalog of hazardous events that kind of lives online and gives people the opportunity to go look at individual case studies and do cross comparisons. The value chain framework is a kind of step by step guidance. Um, this is for intended users like service providers, authorities, user communities, but really everyone who is interested in looking at this value chain concept and applying it um, to some kind of measuring or improving a service. So we've kind of split this framework into four different main parts and and these are kind of the four different main use cases that we see. One is to understand an existing service, how you can map an existing service to see what stakeholders are involved. One is in looking into and improving a service to figure out um, where maybe improvements can be made best at the lowest cost. And then looking into measuring the value of service improvement. So once you've implemented your improvement or your change and you wanna actually see if it's an improvement, what kind of measures can you use um, to measure this? And then kind of designing a new service from the ground up. Um, this can be started with kind of mapping out kind of who's involved, the resources you have and so on, or kind of kind of using a carbon copy from another um, warning so that exists maybe in another country, but applying it um, to, your, to your country yourself. Um, the case study questionnaires and kind of, again, for, this, for the second objective of the project. And the QR code here in the top right leads you to the high weather webpage. Um, and then the kind of the project, the value chain project subpage, uh, where you can access the um, questionnaire with an accompanying guide for clarifications. This is currently a Microsoft Word document that have gone through some iterations of improvement and feedback, and uh, now also includes geological hazards. Um, so we are kind of acknowledging the standard framework for early um, woody hazard early warning systems to also include volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and so on. Um, the structure here at the bottom shows you the questionnaire and how it's kind of divided up. The first part is looking at very essential information for each of the events that we already know from other impact databases. For example, um, the, the uh, hazard type 
uh, the location where it happened, the the time or the time frame or duration when it happens, uh, impact information about economic losses, loss of lives, if any warnings were issued, what the main warnings were, what were the main responses. Um, so this really enables later on, mainly in the online database, to search for events and to filter through and do cross analysis. The second part is then what really sets this questionnaire or this database apart from from the others. So that's digging into the very detailed information about each of the capabilities within the warning value chain. So the weather observations, hazard observation and forecasting, the impact of warning communication, and then in the end, the warning response, as well as the information flow in between. So in the end, we're looking at was all the information that was requested by the following step provided by the, by the previous one, or what was missing, and what could have been done better. The last part then is some kind of subjective rating that's been done by the person who's done this questionnaire who fills this in, but just as an indication um, of the overall performance of the individual parts and of the rolling value chain as a whole. Like, was it kind of successful or was it not successful on a kind of a scale of one to five? So I mentioned already that we're kind of drawing on existing database. We're not, um, we're not trying to, um, replace them, it's more leveraging the information that they provide. Um, and there will be strong ties with other of those, for example, the WMO catalog of hazardous events will be strongly linked um, with the uh, value chain database. Um, there will be links to other databases as well, like EMDAT or this inventar or the ECMWF catalog of severe events. But we're kind of drawing information from it and extending the information that they provide. And we also won't be able to cover the breadth of um, events that they're doing because of the detailed analysis, we, there's a lot of more time required to, to gather all the information in detail. Um, research at, at the um, UK Met Office has just recently done a case study on Storm Eunice, which hit the UK in February 2022. And while doing this um, questionnaire, which can be maybe a, a little bit overwhelming at the start when you, when you look at it, because it had about 80 questions that kind of encompasses all the different parts of the value chain. So it can be a bit intimidating to start off with. Uh, so they had the idea to come up with a um, rapid assessment template or tool, which is uh, like a PowerPoint presentation that you can use to quickly um, just dump information that is like quickly perishable, like warnings that are going out where you take screenshots off or um, other information that you kind of just grab and quickly put into this um, template before storing it into the questionnaire and working more detail on it. It's also a really useful tool to just kind of presenting the key results as it already covers the key questions that we have in the questionnaire. At the bottom here, we have a couple of the case studies we have done so far or, or want to do. Uh, most of them evolved around hurricanes and tropical cyclones. There was a lot of interest in that as well as, as flooding. Um, you see that we also had the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapa eruption um, as a case study, which was very good. And it's worth mentioning that many of those case studies have actually been done by students as part of a class exercise or an internship. So at the moment at the Bureau, we have five interns from a university, and they have been working on the Lismore um, flooding as well as on Black Summer um, bushfires um, last year um, with the interns last year. Um, and they're doing a great job in kind of looking at the case of digging out the information. And we also had a project member from the University of Miami and a Free University of Berlin um, to conduct those case studies with students and complete such questionnaires. So if you're someone engaged in academia and are lecturing in similar classes, you're interested in that, please come and talk to me afterwards. Otherwise, I would like to encourage everyone else also to maybe think about it and to work up a case study. You can yeah, freely download the questionnaire. You can also just use it for your own purpose if you're using on warning systems and you just wanted to cite some um, teething questions maybe and how to, to interrogate some of the case studies. Um, at the end, I just want to draw your attention to some of the publications we recently had. And the two on the right, which look fairly similar, are actually from Brian and myself as conference proceedings papers from the European Meteorological Society conference last year. And Brian has done a, like a, a quick study of, of uh, different cases within Europe and has done a cross-cutting um, analysis um, 
using the, the questionnaire and the value chain concept. And the center one is, is more about the general, um, the project itself, it's kind of what I'm doing now, just in written form. And the one on the left is a collaboration with the citizen science project from High Weather. So here we've looked at the potential role of citizen science within the warning value chain. That Brian has already mentioned, there's lots of opportunities, especially if you're looking at the observational networks that is fairly coarse and how citizens can contribute to this. Um, and with this, I think I'm at the, at the end. And yeah, we are open still for collaborations and new members in the project, even though we are like 75% through the project, um, but everyone is still welcome to join us and work up case studies. Like whether if you're from social or physical sciences, like everyone is welcome and certainly can contribute to the project. And yeah, that I want to end and thank you. I'm wondering actually about having a quick pause here and seeing if there are any questions from anyone on either Brian or David's presentations before I talk about the third project. Has anyone got anything? You can put your hand up. Um, we can check if there's anyone online as well. Nothing online. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably have to run this to you. Hang on. Uh, I, I, I forgot your, um, your name. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a, a survey that you did uh, asking pe uh, people how they received warnings, how they trusted it, how they reacted to it, if I'm not mistaken. And I would like to know whether that was including only residents or also, say, uh, other groups of people who might be interested in this, but might not be familiar with the area, say tourists, migrants, refugees, uh, people with uh, limited language, local language capacities, and so on, and whether you found differences between these groups and uh, the normal residents. Yeah, the question you ask is a very important one. Uh, in the UK, our surveys are um, uh, of residents. Uh, the way that they're done is to um, uh, is, is to select a sample uh, using the electoral register, and then uh, the communication is done automatically. Uh, so that's only residents. Um, we uh, did hope at one stage to carry out an experiment uh, associated with the Paris Olympics to um, compare the uh, perceptions of risk from the Paris residents from the perceptions of risk of the people who were visiting for the games, not quite picking up the migrants issue, but um, unfortunately we, we didn't manage to raise the resources for that. But I think that's a very important area and I, and I hope there will be some research uh, carried out on, on that uh, in, in the future. And certainly the issue of language is, is a big one. Um, e even if people have English as a second or third language, uh, understanding the uh, perceptions of risk that are communicated in the warning um, warning messages is not necessarily how we think it should be. Thank you. Uh, have we got time for one more if anyone's got anything? Okay. All right, this third one here now is on impact-based forecasts and warnings. So part of the high weather project, we've got a working team of 15 um, experts from around the world and looking at what are the gaps and challenges that need to be researched in order to make it easier or sort of justify the use of impact um, forecasts and warnings globally. So what we we kind of had a three step process. The first one was to look at um, what in the literature has already been identified as a gap. The second one was holding um, an international workshop series, which I'll talk about a little more. And we're just pulling that together into a publication now. And you can see our working group members um, on the photo on the right there. We got together in April of this year to discuss our findings. And the map just shows where people um, our registration um, sort of participants came from for the workshop series. So it had pretty good global coverage. So looking now at that virtual workshop series, they were held in October and November of last year. Um, we had three of them. The first one looked at the underpinning data and model integration. 
Second one looked at how we can have better people-centered impact-based warnings. And the third looked at the multi-hazard integration um, aspects. You can see they're at different time zones around the world too, which hopefully pulled a few people in um, globally. Here's an example of the mural virtual whiteboard that we used during the workshops. Um, so first of all, we had a few introductory presentations and, and guest speakers to have a talk about the particular topic. And then we had this um, more interactive whiteboard discussion. We then got all the those sticky notes and we did this um, new uh, sort of analysis coding process, um, a core group of us, about five of us. Um, and, and summarize the themes, which are the yellow, you can't, I know you can't read it, but just the yellow notes there. Uh, and then we brought those to that April workshop at the UK Met Office and had a really interesting discussion over a couple of days about what these research gaps and challenges were and, um, and putting our own kind of analysis and understanding of the literature as well on that. So as I said, we're drafting a publication on this, which we are hoping to get done by the end of this year. Um, and it will be open access as well. But just looking at some of the preliminary findings, this slide here shows what the literature review findings were, and it, it demonstrates the gaps that we found from the expert and research uh, community, the ones that affect the practitioners and the decision makers and users. And so if the, if the green bar stretches across all three, then it's relevant for all three. So the first there is we need to explore the value objectives and in different interpretations of impact-based warnings. We need to determine the governance and co-production techniques, which is a little bit more on the applied side. Determine the roles in the, of the public and private sectors and intermediary actors, such as the media. Across all three, explore measures and relationships along that multi-hazard warning chain and the support and data that are required. Explore the extent of how we can standardize and automate some of this data collection and sharing. How we can translate research to practice and look at how decision makers and users um, experience the warning and the event. So the next step after this is looking into, did our workshop participants agree with those gaps and challenges? Did they already have some solutions that they've been trying and have worked out? And um, what are those remaining gaps? And perhaps we can might be able to provide a little bit of guidance on how those gaps could be built. So that's generally the aim going forward. So I pulled out some of the workshop findings here um, and then ones that are gonna relate specifically to the workshop exercise that we're gonna do after this. So one of the main challenges looking forward is how we can have more tailored and personalized warnings. Because if we're talking about what impacts are going to occur, everyone's going to get impacted in different ways because they've got different things going on in their lives. So is there a way that we can get our warnings? And it, we're using this in a weather sense, but it could equally be applied to other hazards as well. How can we provide these forecasts and, and get it through that warning value chain to impacts that are actually meaningful to people on an individual um, or community sector basis? Can we use local knowledge and indigenous knowledge? Is it appropriate to do so to try and fulfill that? It's a challenge that people have, have identified. Some of the solutions have been to try and maximize user-led personalization. So this would be you or I going onto the Met Services app and saying, these are the types of, of demographics or um, my risk tolerance. And then the, the Met office being able to say, okay, you know, automatically here is, is the appropriate warning for you. Here's the impact information that might be relevant to you. So I think we're starting to move more and more in this direction, but it is going to have to be automated if we're going to do it on this individual basis. Otherwise, you can do it more on a sectoral basis um, and use things like personas and user needs analysis to understand what the different sectors or people want. In terms of multi-hazard complexity, one of the challenges is that our participants identified when an event occurs, it's not occurring in isolation. It may be on, on the back of another event that's just occurred. Like in Auckland, New Zealand, um, we had Cyclone Gabriel come through earlier this year and it was forecast to swing right by Auckland City, our biggest um, city in New Zealand. And they knew that there was going to be more impacts from that event because a big event had occurred just two weeks earlier, causing significant flooding in the area. And so at what point did one event stop and the other one start? You know, how can you 
forecast the impacts of one, um, should it just be connected to the previous one or some other completely different event that's going on at the time, like COVID, for example, and you have these compounding kind of events. So determining the scope in terms of time and space for impact-based forecasts and warnings is a challenge. Another challenge was how to manage the collaborations and connections across different agencies. So often there's a Met office, and then there's also a geoscience agency providing a whole set of different forecasts and warnings for different hazards. And you get something like volcanic ashfall, which requires the two of them to work together. But how consistent are those warnings and forecasts with the other forecasts and warnings that are getting delivered and with the emergency management sector as well? So a lot of different collaborations and sort of governance and strategic direction needed for that. Um, and I think the solutions there are kind of, I've already touched on. Uh, the actions one's interesting though, that was definitely a challenge if you're, for one hazard that's coming, you're, you're giving a forecast a warning and you're providing a suggested action. Does that action, um, is it consistent with the action required for another hazard that's also occurring? So if you think about a flash flood warning alongside a tornado warning, um, one is, you know, might be shelter in a ditch kind of thing and the other one is definitely get out of the ditch. And so it's how do you try and balance up those different actions, which one's more important than the other one? Um, and I think we need to probably do a little bit more research on, on those um, required actions for the different hazards. And then for the communication and uncertainty. So these are how to communicate those high impact, low probability events, basically risk communication. Um, what, how do people perceive and respond to an impact-based forecast and warning? And that's super critical, right? Here we are saying, the WMO is saying, go and make these impact-based warnings, impact forecasting, it's all the rage. But have we actually got a very strong evidence base to say that they're more effective? The answer is no. It's a very mixed result at the moment as to how effective an impact-based warning system is in terms of people's response. So we need to desperately look into that a whole lot more. Um, some of the solutions there is, is doing some research on risk communication. Um, for example, how to do those, those high impact, low probability event communications. Is it a risk matrix or is it more comparable risk? Um, so that's when you say the likelihood of you being impacted by this event is, you know, three times higher than it was before, or it's the same as this other completely different hazard. We need to look into the efficacy of those types of um, risk communication techniques. Um, and then in terms of uncertainty, everyone was always talking about how to communicate uncertainty. There is a lot of research already out there, and I think it will be a matter of connecting what we already know to the people who are um, struggling to communicate this, as well as probably do a little bit more research on it. And then one of the aspects there is how to distinguish between the uncertainty of the hazard occurring versus the uncertainty of the impacts occurring. Right, it should be compounding as you go. And by the time you're forecasting an impact, the uncertainty is going to be really high when you're talking about individual um, impacts. So how can we communicate that across the different impacts that could occur? Okay, so that's the end of the impact forecasting project. Um, keep an eye out for the open access publication when it comes out. Um, but next, we want to gather your thoughts on what the research gaps are for warnings. So as I said, it is on um, weather, but I really would welcome geohazard warning and other types of warnings as well, health warnings, etc. and what your thoughts are for these, for these various questions. Um, so you can see on the right there is a mural board. Now this is the virtual whiteboard that um, people online can go and put your thoughts onto these. Um, I did put the link into the Q&A earlier, so I really hope that you can see that and access it. Um, people in the room, you may either go onto this mural board or you may use the post-it notes and the pieces of paper that are around the room. So you can see them stuck to the walls. Um, I'll read out the questions shortly. And I believe Brian has put the post-it notes onto the pillars down here. Um, otherwise, you are welcome to go onto the mural board, even if you're in the room. If you've got your laptops, probably a little hard off the phone. I'm going to actually read out the bit.ly link in case you want to go onto mural. So if you want to get something ready to jot that down, um, that would be good. I'll give you a minute to get ready and then I'll read it out. 
But first I'll go through the questions. Um, so the first one I'm gonna want your feedback on is what research needs to be conducted relating to tailored or community-led warning systems? You got any idea where poster A is? Yes. Over here, somewhere? <laughs> Around the corner, thank you, Brian. B is what research needs to be conducted to enable warnings to be multi-hazard? Thank you, Brian. C, you got any idea what C is? What do you think are the most important gaps to research relating to risk communication? Thank you, Brian. D, what research activities do you think should be conducted to help meet the target of early warnings for all by 2027? Over there. Over there, thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, so you can see that that one's very broad, right? So it kind of is, if it's not encapsulated in the other ones, and it's specifically for early warnings for all, pop it on there. And then the last one really, is, oh, we've got two more. One is um, I'm really interested in, in understanding user needs because if we're going to be having these kind of tailored or just more targeted warnings, we need to know what people want in a warning. So my question is how do you go out there and find out what people want? You know, there are the usual community-based methods where you can go and just have a, a focus group with a specific community. How do you do that at scale or um, with many, many different sectors? So any advice you've got on that, I think would be great. It's over there as well. Um, and then finally, any other comments or research gaps that you've got, there's one for that as well. Right, so the bit.ly link is bit.ly, like B-I-T dot L-Y slash 466, I don't know if capitals matter, capital B, capital N, little g, capital V. I'll say it again bit.ly slash 466 capital B capital N little g capital V. But don't worry if you didn't get that, you can just use post-it notes and put them on the posters around here. Okay, but you are welcome to go online and do that. So online attendance, please go ahead. There are instructions on the mural board for you, um, but it's pretty basic. You just get your post-it note and you put it on the appropriate umbrella. If everyone sees the intention with the umbrellas. Um, and what we're going to do is have um, Andrea Taylor here from the High Weather Project summarising what she can see from the mural board for the, each question as part of the discussion. <clears throat> so what I invite you to do is uh, stand up and go and get a post-it note, fill it in and pop it on the appropriate poster um, or do it online. Some of the post-it notes apparently don't have a sticky bit on them. <clears throat> I did bring them all the way from New Zealand. I, some of them do, some of them don't. Um, we do have little piles of blue tack. Do you call it blue tack here? Yeah. Um, to stick those post-it notes on. Um, just grab a pen and write right on the page too if you want. That's fine. So we're going to spend a little bit of time doing that. What time is it? Heaps of time? Yeah, about 20 minutes to do this. And we'll have a bit of a chat through after that. Okay, so go forth. Let's see what we've got then. So, starting with A, what research needs to be done relating to tailored or community-led warning systems? And we've got some things about um, in, uh, looking at risk perceptions of different groups, um, engaging with marginalized groups, incorporating local beliefs, Allowing sorry. Are you hearing me? No, I wouldn't use the microphone if I was <laughs> not necessary. Okay, should we uh, should we take our seats again then, and I'll, um, we'll go around and see what we've got. I've uh, got some interesting ones here on. Um, people's mobility patterns and how uh, tailoring might need to take account of those. Uh, so not just uh, tailoring to the person, but tailoring to the person at the particular place at the particular time, which I think is, is a, an important one. Uh, looking at scales of communication, are we trying to reach 100 people or 1,000 people or one? 
Uh, so lots of good stuff on there. I haven't covered it all, but um, let's move on to... Should we do Andrea for that one? B? Oh, Andrea, yeah. What have you got? So some commonalities with um, things that Brian just mentioned. Uh, however, highlighting the point raised earlier uh, by Sally um, with respect to is tailoring actually more effective than additional approaches and highlighting a potential risk that uh, people may feel patronized and not take the warning seriously if it's, I guess, perceived as being like, too tailored. Also some questions about where the data comes from and identifying um, how to build lines of communication between the at-risk communica at com communities and the official warning commun um, communicators and creators. Wow. That's going to take some pulling together. Great, <laughs> great stuff. Um, okay. Um, so moving on to B, what research needs to be conducted to enable warnings to be multi-hazard? Um, so uh, collecting and uh, visualizing examples. Um, some questions about pulling together the different communities, um, harmonizing the different warning systems. Um, issues about different timescales for different um, uh, different hazards. Um, sharing language and uh, the behavioral responses. Uh, what else have we got? Sharing res uh, sharing research on the education that prepares people for uh, multi hazards. So the dealing with compound hazards as opposed to multiple uh, separate hazards, cascades of hazards. Uh, so different ways in which different hazards are connected. Yeah. Um, Andrea? So additional to that, um, questions about whether multi-hazards should be communicated together or whether they should be unpacked and communicated separately and considering the context in which one may be better than the other. Also questions regarding consistency of messaging. So an example given here online is how can a level four heavy rain warning translate into a level two flood warning without this kind of thing creating confusion amongst the general public? So the consistency of format. Also reiterating the importance of collaborations between um, the agencies involved. Super. All right, time to climb the stairs. So the next one, is what do you think are the most important gaps to research in risk communication? Uh, so we've got uh, avoiding communications fatigue. Um, how, uh, knowing how risk is actually understood uh, by the public or indeed by different demographics, different populations. Um, understanding issues about panic, hoarding and movement. Uh, Questions about the scalability of communication methods, uh, the visuals that are used in communicating risk, distinguishing uh, communications for education as opposed to communications requiring action. Another one on communicating different scales consistently uh, on in inclusion of language, uh, languages of minorities like refugees, migrants, and tourists. I think those are, oh, and uh, what have we got up here? Innovative ways to measure what people are actually doing, really important, um, and to do it ethically, of course. And there's an upside down one here which I can't read upside down. Ah, yes. Um, so communication where the, ha the 
effect of the hazard is particular to a particular communi community. Yes, and and um, false alarms, and how and whether they affect communication. Mm. Past false alarms, I guess. Okay, so, um, oh goodness. Okay, so in terms of the online um, responses, there was a lot of commonality there. I guess some new points to raise um, are with respect to the effect of misinformation, as well as questions with respect to the communication of uncertainty within um, tailored warnings and more general um, comments about communicating probabilistic information. Also, an additional point um, asking when do people respond logically versus emotionally and does this affect their use of impact based warning? So I guess kind of that hot versus cold cognition. Right, moving on to the fourth one then. What research activities do you think should be conducted to help meet the target of early warnings for all by 2027? And I see um, uh, right at the top here, um, that uh, the suggestion that we shouldn't be thinking of research, we should be thinking of what we're doing, because there isn't time for research to affect the project, the project of getting everyone uh, to receive warnings. Well, fair point. Um, uh, so, more concretely, um, issues about data access in developing countries, or information access, perhaps. Uh, visualization and technology for those making the warnings. Um, interviewing people who've recently been affected. Uh, again, gathering experience uh, and make and making it public. Uh, simple visualization of forecasts. Uh, put, putting together risk maps, yeah, fundamental in um, the Sendai framework. Um, improved effectiveness of social sensors to understand social aspects. And yes, information about risk, where do hazards occur historically and in the future? So climate change. Okay, um, Andrea? Yep, so online uh, we have some, I guess, some broad um, goals and activities raised here, um, first of which is support um, na all nations to develop warning systems by training forecasters and decision makers in warning communication. So having that training for both the forecasters and those who will be using the forecasts. Um, raising a point with respect to the evaluation of warning systems to actually measure their impact on perception and behaviour with respect to um, warnings. Um, to ask those who will be receiving them uh, directly what they actually need. Um, there's also a point raised on the data side. Um, there's all hazard approach, so a local risk registry that... Um, just pre-warning uh, possibilities, communication ways, methods, and testing drills. Good. Thank you. Moving on, storytelling. Tell us briefly about how you have understood the needs of users for warnings. So we've got uh, talking to them, uh, talking personally to users. Um, the difficulty, so the mention here in terms of earthquakes, the difficulty of uh, explaining to someone how a system might work when they might not need it for decades to come. Um, workshops going through scenarios. Mm. Oh. Establishing trust in warnings through reliability. Involving people in decision making. And what have we got here? People at different levels are uh, needing different levels of detail to because their preparation time and their response time is, is different. Uh, for instance, the emergency responder versus central government um and the suggestion that real events are better than case studies 
uh, when you're trying to uh, use uh, use events to uh, as a as a framework for a discussion with users. Yeah, Andrea. Yep, so online we've just got a few comments on this one, but hi um, some highlighting the importance of feedback. So whether that's in the form of post-event surveys, but also mentioning things such as um, social, me uh, social media. So uh, to address questions such as whether the most vulnerable groups um, are being served as they may not often be represented very well, these kinds of things. Also, uh, there's a general point here um, asking the question, isn't it risky to draw attention to impact? What about overestimation? So I guess potentially thinking about um, drawing attention to impact at the expense of communicating whether something is low likelihood or high likelihood, perhaps. Good. And then finally, any other comments on uh, research needs and gaps? So, issues about evaluation. Um, highlighting the urgency in the face of climate change. Of course, the um, call for early warnings for all was specifically related to it's the role of early warnings as an adaptation to climate change. Uh, so we need to push that. Uh, Long-term funding, uh, assured funding for social, physical and social science collaboration. Deeper knowledge of linked hazards and uh, global catastrophe risk communications. Uh, and uh, here's a nice one. So uh, a new sort of hazard that we haven't considered, abrupt sunlight reduction scenarios. I'm not quite sure what's being suggested there. Is this nuclear winter? I, I, I have to say when I'm driving, the thing that worries me is not sunlight reduction, but sudden sunlight increase, especially when it's right in my eyes. But uh, yeah, so any anything from you? Uh, nothing additional online for this one. Okay, lovely. There we are, Sally. Thank you, Brian and Andrew, for summarising that. Some of the um, couple of things that I took away from that that we may want to look into is looking into effective education and training techniques to see, you know, not just let's go out and do it, but also what techniques work better than others to help to um, to understand risk, um, you know, uh, risk communication and all elements of risk and, and warnings in general. Um, and the trust and warning fatigue, I know it comes up time and time again for me. Every single session that I ever go to and talk at, there's a question about warning fatigue. So I know there is some research out there, but I think we need to do more and um, and really try and hone in on it and in different contexts as well. Um, and just wanted to flag that, it, yes, with early warnings for all, we do need to act for sure and just get it done. But I also like to highlight there is a role for research in that so that we can continue to learn um, going forward as well. So we're not just stopping it in 2027, you know, we need to do research to understand how we can continue to improve as well. Now, in terms of um, citizen sensing that I heard in there, um, and also in terms of use and needs, we've got about five minutes. I just wanted if anyone in the room here has anything that they would like to share, um, a success story or, a story about how they tried to understand user needs and it completely failed um, and why and what could be improved for next time, but um, or research that you've conducted on one of these kind of topics that might be of interest to the room. So I'd like to open up the floor and also I'll check in and see if there's anything in the Q&A for online participants. Um, just stick your hand up and we'll bring the mic around and you've got about two minutes each to, to share what you've done or what you think is important in terms of research and warnings. <coughs> Don't be shy. Everyone's got things to share, I'm sure. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, Bob. I uh, don't want to take Andrew's one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, 
Um, hi, I'm Brenda Phillips. I'm from the University of Massachusetts. I'm a research faculty member there. And um, I run a living lab and severe weather warning. And we have an end-to-end -end system going from sensors actually out to an app that acts as a as a research um, as a research tool, and that app is out in the public's uh, hands, and they get uh, national U.S. National Weather Service warnings. But we're also able to um, send them surveys to understand how they received warnings. But also because we have apps, um, we can track their mobility patterns over time. And I'm also really interested in the idea of personalized warnings um, and understanding both how uh, mobility um, and where people live and their risk perception or needs for weather um, can help with personalization um, of warnings. And so we've had success in, in, um, in kind of modeling some of these patterns, these mobility patterns, because if you think about it, people are pretty boring in their lives and you go to kind of three or four places, you go to work, your home, and, and you know, maybe you pick up your kids or you go to a gym. Um, and so that's been really interesting and, and kind of um, thinking about how you could use that for good warnings and the privacy issues and you know the potential for making a mistake, I think is all really, interesting research to do, but but I think there's something very important there in the personalization. So. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. And I think that will really feed into these personalized, potentially impact-based forecasts. So a little plug, I've just given a TEDx talk on personalized warnings using um, AI and digital footprints and that kind of mobility data, um, as well as your demographic data, your purchase history, it could calculate your risk tolerance levels, all these kind of things, they being the tech giants potentially. And what our role at, um, you know, science agencies basically, what our role is to work with these, the likes of these big tech companies to um, ensure that those warnings, when they come out, we're not just going to get a whole bunch from a whole lot of different companies and that they are different to the government warnings, you know, so looking into that whole aspect, I think is super fascinating. And I think it's going to be the future of, of research and warnings um, going forward. So super important. And thank you very much for sharing the work that you've been doing in that area. Bob? Yep, Bob. So Sally, being a practitioner, as you know, when I first got involved with all this some decades ago, I was thinking action, 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 let's do something to fix this problem that we've been dealing with for so long. And it's only through workshops and other meetings like this that I've learned the real value of the research. Because if we don't have a strong underpinning for what we're doing, then what we do is never going to work. So I feel hesitant sometimes coming to workshops and doing these um, sticky note activities because it seems like we keep introducing new things that we have to be thinking about which sometimes slows down the process, but eventually helps the process move along. So I'm going to toss one in because I haven't heard it mentioned yet today. And I just heard this term at the European Meteorological Society Conference last week in Slovakia. And that was not just misinformation, but disinformation. And you just kind of introduced that before you even knew what I was going to say because you were talking about artificial intelligence. It is so easy for people to put information out that is the wrong information and not only doing it just because they don't understand it, but doing it on purpose to totally mess up what's going on. So we just need to be so careful about what we're doing before we do something to make sure that we've protected the process and made it as robust as possible. So thanks for all the work you're doing. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think with AI coming in and including for image generation and the more um, citizen science and crowdsourcing observations that we include, which I totally encourage and I'm working on that now at home, um, it's going to introduce this problem of, of more and more misinformation and disinformation coming in that we then are in a position to have to verify. And so I think we need to rapidly increase our verification techniques as well 
of these public observations and images that got put on social media, et cetera. So probably AI generated um, verification techniques needed, but also the likes of satellite based observations to help verify um, trusted sources on the ground that can check and this kind of thing. So we need to up our game, I think, in those kind of aspects too. Okay. Oh, it's not working now. I just speak into it. Oh. Yeah. Um, so on the other side of ML, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, I want us to see it as an opportunity as well. So there are threats, but there are also opportunities. So I work at the Met Office, um, Caroline Bain. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at the Met Office is that we have an um, increased amount of data and information going into the forecast. So we now have a huge amount of ensembles that are generated um, in our models. Um, it's a challenge from a forecaster pers perspective to actually um, consume all of this information and then make an informed decision to create your warnings in the first place. So we've got a project called Data Triage, which is looking at um, try trying to consume all of that information and create more accurate warnings from that. And also kind of rebalancing your ensembles or looking at how the ensembles might be evolving in space and time. So we're going to be using machine learning and artificial intelligence in the long term to do that. And also try and blend in the things that we already know from the forecasters knowledge and, and understand and, and monitor some of the decisions that they're making. So I guess I want to just be an advocate that actually artificial intelligence is also an opportunity for us as well in this in this um, arena and this community and we should be looking for ways to enhance those and then the other kind of completely separate project uh, sort of subject is just the role of the private industry as well and that I think it's really important that we work with private industry industries and the tech providers and I'm really glad I'll watch your TED talk that sounds amazing to make sure that we're kind of um, all working together as a community and that they're also part of uh, some of the things that we're trying to achieve because ultimately you know even though they're trying to make a profit hopefully they're still doing the right thing and we want to make sure that they're cre creating and um, you know disseminating the right information. Yeah thank you great points and I totally agree that AI is is a good thing, like it should be, and generally <laughs> for increasing our forecast accuracy and our models and and all that kind of thing. So fingers crossed for the future, and I'm sure it'll be great. <laughs> all right, I think we'll wrap up now. Brian, happy? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Great discussion and contributions, and I'll see you around the conference. Thank you.